the city of San Francisco, one of several streamlined trains of its time to be introduced in the 1930s. The train ran from Chicago to the Oakland Pier in San Francisco. It was jointly operated by the Chicago and Northwestern, the Union Pacific, and the Southern Pacific. The Chicago to Omaha route leg was run by the Chicago and Northwestern. The next leg from Omaha to Ogden, Utah was run by the Union Pacific, and then the final leg to San Francisco was run by the Southern Pacific. Operation started on June 14, 1936, and it was also one of the first trains to be pulled by the then new EMD E2A diesel locomotives. This long distance train enjoyed a nice safety record until one day everything changed. August 12, 1939. The train, led by E2A SF1, nicknamed the Queen Mary, and B units SF2 and SF3, was making its way to Oakland. The train was running half an hour late. Engineer Ed Heacox, who was the engineer that day, sped the train up to 90 miles an hour to make up for lost time. The speed limit, however, was 60 miles an hour. The train had just passed Carlin, Nevada at 9.30 p.m. and was about to cross the Humboldt River east of Harney on the number 4 bridge when all of a sudden... train derails and the cars plunge into the riverbed below. The B units were partially derailed but SF-1 stayed upright. Hecox, still an SF-1, was unharmed and ran back to Harney to contact emergency services. Volunteers from the nearby towns of Biowawa and Carlin rushed to the scene with medical supplies, but survivors would not be taken to hospital until a rescue train was assembled and took them to Elko the next morning. The SP tracks were out of service for several months, but the nearby tracks of the Western Pacific were intact and used for both the rescue trains and regular service until the SP tracks were repaired. 24 people perished in the wreckage, and 121 were injured. It was one of the first derailments of a streamlined pasture train and one of the first to involve a diesel locomotive. By morning, an investigation was launched about the cause of the wreck. It quickly became clear that it was an act of sabotage. Several spikes were pulled out and a rail was moved inward, causing the cars to jump the track. In the following days, divers discovered tools in the Humboldt River. The tools looked very similar to those used by railroad workers. Investigators believed it would take a very strong person about an hour to move the tracks and noted the previous train had passed through the area four hours prior without incident. There was suspicion that the wreck was caused by a disgruntled worker and so the Southern Pacific put out a $5,000 reward to find the saboteurs. The reward was soon lifted to $10,000 later on. 1,144 leads were investigated and interrogated without much luck. However, that wasn't the SP's only headache. Twisted steel wreckage of the cracked transcontinental train, the city of San Francisco, lies in the Humboldt River Canyon, 40 miles west of Elko, Nevada. Officials gave the cause as sabotage, for an entire rail had been moved four inches inward. Fourteen cars plunged off the track, but the diesel-powered locomotive did not upset, although it thundered on a thousand feet beyond the wreckage. Twenty-two perished and sixty were injured as the cars broke through a bridge and hurtled to the bed of the river. Damage is put at upwards of half a million dollars. The news media was covering the wreck and was being very hostile to the Southern Pacific. One of the first newspaper reporters on the scene was a photographer for the Elko Daily Free Press, who took pictures of the railroad cars dangling over the side of the bridge into the river and tipped over. The SP accused the paper of publishing pictures taken at angles that made the damage appear worse than it was. The photographer then responded, saying, 
God knows. It would have been impossible to make it look worse than it was. The railroad was also criticized for the amounts paid in compensation. In one case, a passenger had originally bought a ticket on a regular coach fare train, but then later upgraded to the city of San Francisco, a premium fare train. The railroad, however, only refunded the difference between the two tickets, not the full coach fare ticket. This led to the conspiracy theory that the sabotage story was a cover-up to hide the railroad's negligence in allowing the engineer to operate the train at such high speeds. These papers interviewed and noted that some passengers were uncomfortable with the speed of the train several minutes before it derailed. As the train rounded corners, passengers had difficulty standing and some beer bottles were shaken right off tables. Despite this, the official position of the SP and the FBI remained unchanged, that the train was indeed sabotaged, noting the evidence of the rails were moved and the track circuits were bypassed. In the end, five cars were destroyed and written off. SF-601, the Presido, a 32-seat coffee shop slash kitchen car. SF-602, the Mission Dolores, a 72-seat diner. SF-701, the Embargadito, a dormitory, buffet, lounge car. And two sleeper cars, Twin Peaks and Chinatown, which were both owned by Pullman at the time. The E units were put back into service. The two B units, SF-2 and SF-3, went to the Union Pacific. They were used until 1953 where they were rebuilt into E-8B's 922B and 923B. These rebuilds utilized very little of the previous locomotives and were effectively trade-ins. SF-1 went to the Southern Pacific and retained its E-2 body until it was rebuilt into EMD E7M 6017 at the Los Angeles shops in 1953, but sadly, all three units never made it to preservation. All that's left of the E2s today are the pair of Winton Model 201A V12 diesel engines that were from SF1. They were, res they were rescued from scrap and eventually became part of the collection of artifacts at the California State Railroad Museum at Sacramento. One of the prime movers has now been transferred to the Illinois Railroad Museum as of September of 2009. As for the City of San Francisco train itself, it continued in service for several years. Chicago and Northwestern backed out of the train in 1955 and the Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul, and Pacific Railroad, better known as the Milwaukee Road, took over the route. Sadly, the train was discontinued on May 1, 1971, being replaced by Amtrak's San Francisco Zephyr. As of today now, the route is now part of Amtrak's current California Zephyr, as the San Francisco Zephyr was discontinued in 1983. The case received new attention after the 1995 Palo Verde, Arizona derailment when the Sunset Limited was sabotaged. While investigating that incident, Southern Pacific investigators noted the similarity of the two events, namely tracks being moved on the bridge with a high embankment and bypassing track circuits so the signaling system would not warn of a track break. While the Southern Pacific believed the saboteur was one of their own employees, to this day, 80 years later, the wreck of the city of San Francisco remains unsolved. And it also remains the deadliest rail disaster in the history of the state of Nevada. Who knows who really caused this terrible disaster?
Hello everyone, it's me again. I'm gonna be sneaking this announcement at the end. I'm going to be present at Lansdale Founders Day from August 23rd to August 25th. I'll be there all three days, and I'll be traveling with my close friends. Uh, Train Fan 5202 is gonna be there. Tony Zamtrak Train videos will be there. I don't know if Scepter Rail Fan 1000 will be there as well, but you never know. You can also see the Lansdale Freight House at Vine and Railroad Street to see our current progress. We plan to have it set up as a display, but we don't know for sure yet. There's also a model train display at the Fairmount Fire Company, which I'll check out as well. And I'll railfan the Lansdale and Satterton excursions on the 23rd and 25th, while I'll ride the Stony Creek excursion at 11.30 and then chase it on the 24th. New Hope 40, however, will not make it as planned due to problems being discovered not long after the... Uh, May 18th excursion at uh, North Wales, so it'll be diesel powered with engines from Penn Northeastern and New Hope. Full details on when I'll arrive and leave will be up on Patreon, and they will be released to the public on August 22nd. If you just can't wait, then become a Patreon today, with the cheapest pledge being $5 a month. If you see me anywhere, then don't be shy, just come up and say hello. Who knows, you might even get a shout out. Hope to see you there. Anyways, that's it. See ya.